Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tammy Wilson, and I am from the Sacramento County Office of Education, and I'm the project lead on the California Dyslexia Initiative. Uh, Happy New Year. We are really excited to have so many colleagues join us from across the state, and we know that um, this is going to be an incredible learning opportunity for all of us. We'd uh, like to welcome you to our Understanding Dyslexia webinar series. This is our fourth webinar, and this time we are featuring Dr. Julie Washington, and I am really looking forward to learning from her today. We it actually connects to some work we were doing this morning in a different learning network, so I'm super excited. Uh, we have created a Padlet that houses the slides, and when we'll be dropping that link into the chat for you to access. The Our um, sessions are also recorded, and they will be posted on our SCOE California Dyslexia Initiative website in a few days. That usually takes a few days. There is also a companion document that goes along with each session that you can use to further explore the topics. Um, The California Dyslexia Initiative is a collaboration. SCOE is partnering with the the University of California San Francisco Dyslexia Center and working very closely with CCEE and CDE on this project. And one of our goals, and next slide please, is to really work on disseminating professional learning around uh, students who are struggling or need early intervention or students who are dyslexic. So we are using the system of support to disseminate those professional learning resources. And this webinar series is one of those resources. For this webinar series, we have partnered with our fabulous friends at Glean Education. And I, it is my pleasure to turn the mic over to founder and CEO of Glean and also my friend, Jessica Hammond. So Jessica. Thank you so much, Tammy. We are thrilled to partner with SCOE and the California Dyslexia Initiative to coordinate this webinar series. For those of you who may not know about us, Glean Education partners with schools, districts, and states to deliver online training, school leader consulting, and web-based coaching. Our work aims to build educator understanding of evidence-based literacy practices to improve student literacy outcomes. Next slide, please. This webinar is the fourth in a series of webinars on dyslexia and literacy delivered by some of the nation's top experts in the field. If you haven't already registered for them, we'll be popping the registration links in the chat so you can be sure not to miss them. Next slide, please. So today it is my true pleasure to introduce Dr. Julie Washington. Dr. Washington is a professor in the School of Education at the University of California, Irvine. She's a speech language pathologist and is a fellow of the American Speech Language Hearing Association. Dr. Washington directs the Learning Disabilities Research Innovation Hub funded by the National Institutes of Health, Eunice Kennedy Shriver National Institute on Child Health and Human Development. She's also director of the Dialect, Poverty, and Academic Success Lab at UCI. Currently, Dr. Washington's research is focused on the intersection of literacy, language variation, and poverty. In particular, her work focuses on understanding the role of cultural dialect in assessment, identification of reading disabilities in school-aged African-American children, and on disentangling the relationship between language production and comprehension on development of reading and early language skills for children growing up in poverty. Please help me welcome Dr. Julie Washington. Thank you, Jessica. I am uh, very happy to be here this morning or afternoon or whatever it is. Um, I think it's afternoon. Uh, (laughs) But I'm very happy to be here and to talk about something that's very near and dear to my heart. um, And that is the performance of African American kids and how it relates to um, language use. Um, We all know that um, we have a crisis in this country as it relates to reading in general. And with specific subgroups of students we have, we are having even a more significant crisis. And so I wanna talk about one of those groups today. So I always like to start with um, 
our assumptions, shared assumptions about um, what it is we're talking about here. And one of our assumptions is that reading is a language skill. Um, so that in order to teach children to read, you have to engage them linguistically. And whereas in 2022, that sounds obvious, it hasn't always been. Um, it has just been in the last 25 or years or so that we really um, made very clear connections between um, literacy and language. I'm a speech pathologist. And one of the things that we have always known as clinicians is that our students who have language impairments struggle with anything related to print. And so we have always viewed um, reading as language on paper, but that has not always been true, I think across the board as educators. And then um, there was a book that was edited by um, uh, Catherine Snow, and it was called um, Preventing Reading Difficulties in, children, in Young Children. And one of the things they said in that book was that um, reading is a language skill. And so in order to teach reading, you need to engage language um, experts. And at some level, so for me as a speech pathologist, I'm a language expert by training, but what we need is for teachers to also be um, expert with language and understand how to develop it and how to recognize when you need to engage students linguistically in order to move um, reading forward. So oral language is a foundational skill. Um, and one of the things, you know, today we're talking about kids who are African-American and her, who are growing up in poverty. Um, we have been challenged, I even have been challenged as a professional to be more open about what we consider literacy. And so, you know, for our students who are growing up in poverty, literacy development be begins long before they show up in school, just like other kids. It's just not always conventional. And so it doesn't always look like what we expect it to. There may not be anybody at home reading books. There may not be books at home, but literacy happens uh, and, and exposure to print happens in different ways for kids. So long before there's conventional reading instruction, there is um, exposure to environmental print. And we now talk about environmental print like we're talking about the environment. Um, in a green way. But when I say environment, I mean things like the golden arches at McDonald's, the stop sign, all of those things that kids start to recognize symbolically as being words. That is early literacy. Um, I have two sons who are adults now, and my older son, when he was probably four and learned to read his first word, it wasn't his name, it was Nike because it was on the back of his shoes. That's environmental print. He saw Nike long before he ever saw Justin on a page. So that is what we're talking about. And that counts as literacy. It's just that when kids get to school, I don't think we always know how to leverage it in order to help kids move forward. But long before we see them, they have had some exposure to print. One of the things we know absolutely for sure is that kids with language weaknesses or language impairments when they get to school are gonna have trouble with reading. Um, and we can continue to see those kids having difficulty throughout their schooling unless those weaknesses are resolved. When it comes to impairments, um, hopefully we see kids getting into speech and language services, but there are a lot of our kids who come to school where it's not an impairment. It's just weak language skills or underdeveloped vocabulary. And that's something we see a lot in our kids growing up in poverty. Vocabulary is a combination of word knowledge and world knowledge. And um, often children who are growing up in poverty don't have the world knowledge that you need to develop a strong foundation in word knowledge. And so these are kids who are at higher risk as they move through school of having uh, reading problems or and even reading disabilities. So among our low income children, our ethnic and language minority children and immigrants, these kids are particularly at high risk 
for having difficulty with reading. And I'm going to talk about African American kids. We talk about the NAEP a lot, the National Assessment of Education Progress. It's considered the nation's report card. In fact, we call it that um, many times. And so every couple of years, we test our fourth graders, our eighth graders, our 12th graders, and look at their um, academic skills. And one of the most important skills, of course, is reading. And in 2019, when we tested our African-American fourth graders across the country, 81% were reading at a basic level or below. And only 19% were considered proficient or advanced. So many of these kids were reading below grade level. Um, in fact, most of them. And then a few of them were really proficient readers or advanced readers. And these are numbers we really have to change. That's more than eight out of 10 kids. Um, and that's just not acceptable. And I guess I have to say here that we're not doing that well overall. Okay, so even kids who aren't African American, we see at fourth grade that about 60% of kids are struggling with reading at this basic level or below. And um, about 40% are proficient or advanced if they're not African American or Native American or um, Spanish speakers. And so what we are seeing is that we're not doing that well, but even with that number being poor, twice as many of those kids are reading at a proficient or advanced level compared to African-American kids. So um, one of our concerns, we always talk about the achievement gap um, and reading is part of that gap, the reading gap. There's a language gap, there's a reading gap. Um, but one of the um, things that we do know is that as African-American kids continue to matriculate through school, the gap gets bigger. It does not get smaller, it continues to grow. And you know, if you think about it, especially for our low income kids, and if you think about it, the kids who came into school really prepared aren't waiting for them to catch up. They're continuing, continuing to grow also. And so these kids are growing. I don't wanna make it seem like even with the, um, the gap growing that children aren't learning, they are learning, but it's so slow. And that's one of the things that we see is that there's an acceleration issue that when a child comes to school and they're far behind, we have to find ways to accelerate. Um, and that's become particularly critical during this time of the pandemic. When many kids, everybody was at home last year and some kids showed up, some didn't for online learning and some showed up for a while and then they disappeared. And so for those children, we know that this gap is even bigger and in order for them to continue to benefit from instruction, we need to accelerate their growth and try to help them get caught up. So we know that the gap grows. And yet, even though we know all of these things about um, African-American kids, the trouble they're having with reading, we're also now becoming concerned about whether they are being identified for special education when they need it. Everyone who's having trouble reading, those eight out of 10 are not reading disabled, but some of them are. And we know that not only are these students unlikely to be getting the reading instruction that they need to accelerate their growth, but when they need more support, that they are very unlikely to be um, identified for special education. This is an interesting point to me because as a, when I think about why I do what I do, this is what got me interested. When I was a student, finished my degree, I was really interested in over-representation of African-American kids in special education. That was the conversation we were having at that time. And they were particularly overrepresented in speech and language um, impairment, which I was concerned about. What are we doing? as a discipline that we're contributing to this overrepresentation. Also at that time, we were talking about how African-American kids are overrepresented in the learning disabilities category. And here we are, fast forward, and we have swung, the pendulum has swung to in the other direction. And so I'm not gonna tell you how many years it's been, but uh, <laughs> it is the case that we went from overrepresentation to being really concerned about underrepresentation for um, kids from minority backgrounds, kids who are non English speaking, 
And we see, or who are English learners, not non-English speaking, but English learners, we're seeing that these kids are not being represented well in special education, not getting the services that they need, and that the categories in which they used to be overrepresented, they are now underrepresented. Speech and language pathology and learning disabilities. And that is a concern. Um, and anybody who's ever heard me talk, I always talk about this, that part of the problem, I, we, I see us being at the opposite end right now. One of the concerns I have with the IDEA is the exclusionary criteria for learning disabilities. And this conference is about dyslexia, which is where learning, um, which um, is housed under the SLD diagnostic category in schools. The exclusionary criteria for LD um, restrict children from diagnosis of SLD whose learning problems are primarily the result of environment, culture, or economic disadvantage. And so for African-American kids who are disproportionately poor, this means that they are very likely to be identified. So one of the things that's changed since I started is the policy. So some of this is a policy issue and a policy issue that needs to be addressed. But look at the IDEA 2004, that is 18 years ago. It needs to be reauthorized so that we can address some of this disparity that we see not only for African-American kids, but for poor kids, English learning kids and other um, groups. Because currently in the US, it's not possible to be poor and have LD. If you're poor and you can't read, we assume that you can't read because you're poor, because that's what our policy says. That's a real concern. And there is a researcher at, um, she's at Rutgers now, um, Wanda Blanchett, who talks about dyslexia as a diagnosis of privilege for the privileged. And is it because we are as parents or as educators deciding we're gonna exclude poor kids? No, you know, our policy allows that. So our federal policy. So when I look at the dyslexia laws, now I'm on a soapbox. So when I look at the dyslexia laws that we are now passing in states, they're really important. Um, I, it, they're grassroots efforts, but they're also all based on the federal law. So even at the state level now, in order to absolutely be called dyslexic, we are using this federal definition. And I fear that we're going to exacerbate this discrepancy that we're seeing in diagnosis across the country. So I would caution us to be careful about excluding groups based on this diagnosis and think about how we're including kids and not excluding them. Okay, so for African-American kids, this is a, we're um, talking about the reading problem a little bit differently now, and I think it's to the benefit of children. And that is that it's a public health issue. It's not just an educational issue. That society suffers when children can't read. Um, and so when we talk about what happens to kids who do not learn to read um, well or well enough to be functional in their lives, we see it influence not only their schooling, but their employment, their housing, their well being overall. And so when we think about um, organizations like the National Institutes of Health, they are as concerned about reading as the US Department of Education is, because this is a public health issue for us, because it's not about just skills and abilities, it's about access and opportunity. Access to excellent education and the opportunity to benefit from a good solid education. And in that way, it is also considered a health disparity. Um, health disparities are preventable differences in the burden of disease, injury, violence, or opportunities to achieve optimal health that are experienced by socially disadvantaged populations. So when we're talking about kids who are low income, who are having difficulty with reading, it is not just about education, it is about health. And I think that's important. Um, and so for me as a scientist, I'm really interested in the role of language. How does language, 
um, influence influence what happens with kids in terms of their diagnosis, in terms of uh, the development of reading overall. And I'm particularly interested in language variety. And in my case, I'm interested in African-American English. And so I'm gonna talk about African-American English and some of these other issues that you see on the page. So just like I start with, uh, what are our assumptions? What is language? Language, this is an important issue. It's like, you know, people listening, yeah, I know what language is. Well, we need a shared definition because it matters for um, how language varieties are perceived. So this is a very basic definition of language. So language is a rule governed symbol system. Um, words are produced to represent actions, objects, and ideas. So when I say the word car or truck, you get a picture of a car or truck in your head and that word represents that object. Um, language, words can be pr um, produced in finite combinations that can be used to generate sentences, to express new ideas. So every language has rules for how words are, how words are created how um, sentences are combined to create meaning. And um, that's what language is. Language is also an innate skill, which is really important when you think about reading because reading is not innate. And by innate, we mean that all of us come into the world wired to produce language. And um, whether or not you develop language well depends on your input, but that doesn't change the fact that we're wired um, to produce language. And the only exceptions we see typically are children who may have impairments, for example. But we're wired and ready when we come into the world to produce language in either a verbal or nonverbal form. So the nonverbal form, of course, is American Sign Language and other forms of um, nonverbal communication like um, augmented communication. And um, so this is what language is. And the last bullet though is really important for thinking about language in general and language varieties in particular. Language is agreed upon by a community of speakers. So it's the people who speak the language in their own homes, communities, um, regions that decide how language is used, what's acceptable, what's unacceptable and um, what makes you a member of the group. That's one of the things that's really important about language culturally is that it signals group membership, the way that you use it. So if you're a Spanish speaker, it, um, you belong to that community of speakers. If you're an African-American English speaker, you belong to that community of speakers. And we agree on how it is to be used. So that's what language is. So what is a dialect? It's a variety of language. Every language has dialects, every single one in the world. In English, there are many dialects and they differ by social, eth eth uh, ethnic or cultural groups. So I'm talking about one that focuses on a particular cultural group and that's African-American people, but it's also by region. So there's Southern English, there's Bostonian English, there's Northeastern English. And as much as people in California think they don't have a dialect, you do. There's also a Western dialect and California sounds really different. Um, and I can hear it since I've moved here and I'm fascinated by a lot of the things that I hear um, because this is a new region for me. I've been here for a year. And so across these groups and across these regions, there's an agreement about how language is used. The problem is we don't always respect it. And that's what becomes a problem for um, users of different language varieties. And so when we talk about African-American English, which is what I'm gonna talk about today related to reading, it is a systematic rule governed variation of English, which is the definition of dialect, by the way. A dialect is a systematic rule governed variation of the major language in the country or in whatever area you're in. Um, African-American English is used by most African-Americans, but not all of them. And like most language varieties and dialects, it has developed as an oral language system. It does not have a written counterpart. So there are no rules that have codified this dialect for use in written language, 
although you will see it in written language. I know teachers are thinking, yeah, but I see it. You do see it because we write the way we talk. So if you're a child who says with instead of with, you will spell it W-I-F. You will write it exactly the way you say it. And we also, because what writing is really is encoding your oral language. So whatever you're doing in oral language, you will also do typically in writing. But that's different than us um, codifying this as a system and um, producing it in writing. That does not happen. It's primarily an oral language. But the last bullet is the most important thing for this dialect and many others. It is a low prestige dialect. And that has influenced how we respond to it and whether we allow it to be used in the classroom. And that is true for every low prestige dialect and certainly true for this one. So what is a low prestige dialect? We always talk about dialects in terms of prestige. Some are high prestige, some are low prestige. If I was in a room with you, I would ask you to identify a high prestige dialect, but since you can't, I'll identify it for you. So when I ask people, um, when I'm speaking to them in person, to give me an example of a high prestige dialect, the first one that comes up every single time is British English. So you hear a British accent, which is part of your dialect. Your accent is part of your dialect. People hear a British accent and they think the person is high class, drinks tea and is related to the queen. That's really high prestige, really positive characteristics associated with this accent. That's a high prestige dialect. Within high prestige dialects, there are also low prestige varieties. Low prestige dialects are dialects when you hear people speak them, you attribute negative characteristics to the speaker. High prestige, you attribute positive characteristics to the speaker. So within British English, there's Cockney. Cockney English is a dialect of British English that we associate with people who are more low income, working class, maybe not as well educated. So within a high prestige variety, there can also be a lower prestige. So what is an example of a high prestige variety in the United States? When I ask this of an audience, the typical answer is Bostonian English. The English of the Kennedys though, not the English in the inner city in Boston, but the English of the Kennedys is considered high prestige. The other answer I get is standard English. So sort of this English of the media that that's also considered a high prestige variety. I would agree with that, although would argue with the terminology, I would agree with that. What is a low prestige variety in the United States? There is never any disagreement on this. It is Southern English. Because remember, when you hear what makes something low prestige is when you hear someone speak it, you attribute negative characteristics to them. My friends in the South, I came here from Georgia, um, know that when people hear that accent, oh my goodness, redneck, dumb, um, all kinds of like really negative characterizations. And I have friends actually who have, I have a, one really good friend who has a very um, Southern accent and she is reticent to speak when she leaves the South because she knows that people automatically think she's not as smart because of her accent. That is really low prestige. So we judge people by the way they speak even when it's not appropriate. So we conflate the speaker and the language system they use. So that brings us to African-American English where when we hear um, individuals and I'm gonna talk about the characteristics, when we hear individuals, especially boys and probably teenage boys um, use African-American English, the things that people think about them, thugs, unmotivated, just all these really negative things. Why is this important? Because what does it, what does this mean for a six-year-old? It's one thing to be 16 and have people treat you that way, that's bad enough. But when you're a child who is entering school for the first time, four or five or six years old, you come in using the characteristics of the language of your community and that language is not 
considered in high prestige, then we conflate the child's ability with the way that they talk and the low expectations become an issue for students. And so I want us to be careful of that. What does African-American English do to English? It adds and deletes morphemes. These are the things that I'm gonna show you are not the only characteristics, they're just the most common ones. So adds and deletes morphemes, all the S's are impacted. The possessive S, the plural S, and the third person singular S can all be deleted. Sometimes they're there, sometimes they're not. And that's one of the things about dialects is that its features are variably included. They are not always gone. Sometimes they're there, sometimes they're not. And there are rules that govern their use. I would tell you what they are if I knew. That's one of the things we're actually studying now, especially developmentally, what governs whether a child is gonna use certain forms or not. And is there a way for us to um, benefit from that in the way that we teach? So the S forms and then past tense ED. One of the important things about the deletion of anything in a language variety is that a typical speaker will never delete something that makes the message ambiguous. You will still be able to understand the message. So if I delete the past tense, it's because I already said yesterday or last week. So there's no confusion about whether we're talking about something that happened in the past. Um, and that is the case for typical speakers Atypical speakers, like a child with a language impairment, actually might do things that are ambiguous, but a typical speaker just doesn't. African-American English changes the main verb in the verb phrase also. That top one, deletion of copulate and auxiliary, is just deletion of forms of the verb to be, is the most common syntactic feature of African-American English. He running fast, it's a, it a red car, he hungry, so you delete that form. So whereas in American English, the subject and the verb are considered obligatory, they're always there. That is not true for dialect speakers. You can delete verbs. When you delete the copular or auxiliary, remember what I said about never being ambiguous? What happens when you delete the forms of the verb to be? Nothing, doesn't change the message at all. He's running fast, whether is is there or not. But if it's, he was running fast, it is obligatory. It will always be there because that would change the meaning. So there, that's that thing about being rule governed. There are rules for what you can delete, what you can add and why you do it. So anything that's gonna make it hard for you is always gonna be there. Um, subject verb agreement is also the second most common feature. These are really common. They was looking for something that's almost always was and were. It's interesting in this dialect that the verb be is impacted a lot when we talk about the verb phrase because the next two are about be also. I always include habitual be because people know it and have heard it and it's one of my favorite ones. So he be getting some ice cream. Habitual be is use of the um, infinitive form of be regardless of the subject. So he be, she be, they be, the dog be, can always be used that way, but it doesn't mean the same thing as is or are. So that's the other thing about um, dialects is that you have to know enough about them to know what they mean. So he be getting some ice cream doesn't mean he is getting some ice cream. It means he be getting some ice cream all the time. That's what habitual means. So anytime you see be used in this way, you can put all the time at the end of the sentence. And that's what it means. She be buying clothes. That means she's always buying clothes. You know, the dog be howling. It means he howls every day. He's always howling. It's not the same as is or are. So they have different meanings. Remote past been, I've been knowing how to swim means I've known how to do that for a long time. So it's different ways of using this verb form to transmit meaning. And when I have people in my audience from the South, they recognize, especially the last one, remote past Ben is a Southern feature also. Most African-American people have their roots in the South. 
And so African-American English developed in the South and it's associated with the cultural group because when our ancestors and our family left the South, they brought it with them. So I grew up in Seattle, but my parents are from Arkansas and Texas. And so they left the South migrated to the West and brought these features with them as did many other members of the community. So whether you are meeting African-American people in Seattle or Maine or Florida or wherever, if there's a community where this dialect is used, um, you're gonna find it no matter what part of the country you're in. So that's why it's associated with African-American people, but it is rooted in the South. It also impacts phonology, which you know, morphology and phonology definitely impact reading and we know that. Um, the examples that I give here are very common. I also talk, already talked about with for with. So when you talk about um, THs, whether they're voiced or voiced, voiced or voiceless, they can be um, substituted. So if it's voiced, it'll be bave, V for TH, like bave and baving. If it's voiceless, it's F or T. For TH in the final consonant position. Pre vocalic position, it's a D. So, dis, dat, dem, dos, day is also very common. And one of the interesting features is consonant cluster reduction, where we, at the end of a word, the final consonant can be deleted if it occurs with another consonant. Very common. Interesting to us because often when you delete the final consonant, you create a real word another real word. So this is coal and it is cold. And so one of the things we wonder is what happens when a child hears this going um, in a speech stream, if you can produce coal and cold the same way, um, does it slow you down a little bit? So it's not about comprehension, it's about um, processing speed, figuring out what that means. Um, one of the examples of this that I got from some teachers in Wisconsin that I thought was like the best example I've ever heard about why consonant cluster reduction in the final position is so important and interesting is she talked about the state test in Wisconsin where they have an item where um, some bandits go in and they rob the bank and the sheriff is chasing them and they decide to hold up. And so what they want to know in the, um, you know, the, the comprehension questions afterward is what does hold up mean? Is it to hide? Is it to wait? Is it to, and then there are these examples. Well, she said, when I gave this example of constant coastal reduction, she said, oh my God, every African-American kid in my class gets this one wrong. And now I understand why, because for African-American people, Hold up means wait. It doesn't mean hide. Hold up. And so all of her kids chose the wrong one, but they chose the same one. And that's a good example that this means something different when you delete that final consonant to this group of speakers. So I always think that's such a great example. It's also a stupid item. What is a bandit in 2022? But anyway, uh, <laughs> so the impact of cultural language differences is what we're really concerned about, that when kids who come to school with a different language variety, whether it's African-American English, Hawaiian English, Filipino English, whatever kind of English it is, they are not only learning the language of school in terms of the academic English like sentence structure, they also need to learn how language is used in print um, because it's very different than the way that they are using it in oral language. So they have, another job to do. And, um, you know, we, we call these kids bi-dialectal, kids who have more than one language variety, two dialects. The first dialect is general American English, which is some, sometimes called standard English, but not by me, um, because it doesn't get to be the standard. It's on a continuum with everything else. So these kids need to learn, no, they do know typically general American English and African American English. So we call them bi-dialectal. And to know it all are in Cyprus at the University of Cyprus and they study Cypriot Greek. And they are making an argument for these kids being considered dual language learners like English learners um, because it puts them 
their home dialect puts them at a disadvantage in learning environments, just like speaking another language does, unless you consider it in teaching. And so that's what, that's what I'm arguing for. I'm gonna be arguing for today is that I agree with them that we need to be thinking about within language variation, the same way we think about across language variation, that in both cases, kids have work to do to get to the text. So I talk about that as cognitive load, that um, Johnson, look how many years ago this was. This was like forever ago, over 50 years ago, talked about the mismatch hypothesis. And the idea is that during reading, the mismatch between your oral language system and the one used at, the one from your community and the one you use at school increases the cognitive load um, because you have more work to do to get to text. You have to get from your system to the text that sits in front of you, whether you speak another language or a dialect. And you know, one of the examples that I give of that, that I'll give very quickly, um, that uh, I worked with a little girl who was four. This was the beginning of my career and she's the one who got me interested in this. I read the book, Are You My Mother? to her. And when I read the book, everybody, teachers always know, Are You My Mother? So, it's a baby bird who and hatches from the egg while the mother's out of the nest and it's going in search of his mother. And so he stops all these objects and animals and people and says, are you my mother? And then the response is, I am not your mother. I am a chicken or whatever. So this whole book uses this pattern. And so I read this book to this little girl, African-American girl, low income, and it was a story retelling context. So I read the story, she's listening, and then she gets to retell it to me. And remember she's four, so she can't read. She's just retelling it based on what she heard from me. So she looks at the pictures and she opens the book and she says, is you my mama? I ain't none of your mama. And then she told the whole book that way. It was so funny. I mean, I laughed, she laughed, we had a great time. Then I went back to my office and thought about what it takes for her to listen to a book being read to her in a dialect that she actually doesn't speak. And then to hold on to the elements of the story in terms of working memory, absolute memory, um, executive function, all these skills that you need to retell a story, to listen to a story. She had to listen to it, understand the story, and then retell it to me in a different system than the one that I used. That's what I mean by cognitive load. That's a lot of work. And in this little girl's case, she was so good at it, but a lot of our low-income kids are not. Getting from the oral language that you bring to the classroom to the text that you encounter in books is work. All of the ki most kids can do it, but it depends on us, I think, supporting them. We care about this because kids who haven't learned this school code, the written code, by the end of third grade, we see are really far behind by the time they get to fourth grade, fourth and fifth grade, at least um, a grade level behind. And the standardized assessments that we use are also being impacted by language. And so if these kids are not getting to the language of the classroom, it's influencing language-based classroom activities. So reading, writing, all of those. But what we know about dialect is 95% of African-American kids are using it when they come to school, regardless of socioeconomic status, because they're coming from home. And whatever your parents are doing, when you show up in preschool, that's what you're doing. And what happens typically is that kids learn the language of the classroom by being there. There's a lot of variability in the amount of dialect that kids use. There are high users, moderate users, and low users. Why do we care about that? Because it turns out not every dialect user is going to have trouble with reading. It's the ones who use the most because theirs is the furthest away from text and the furthest away from the language of the classroom. This turned out to be really important. I learned it in Georgia because we had Southern dialect. We had African-American English. And it was really important because I know everybody speaks a dialect. So if dialect really matters for reading, why isn't everybody having trouble with reading? Turns out it's just a group of kids and it's this continuum that really matters. 
So low, e low income kids use more dialect overall than middle income kids and boys use more than girls. We found that when we looked at gender and socioeconomic status all these years ago, and we continue to see that, that there's something about using the language of the community with boys that is really valued. And we see the same thing with men actually. And so there's some gender piece related to this and our low income kids, we know that they use a lot more dialect than their middle income peers typically. And if they, if middle income kids use it, they also learn to code switch because they have more world experience. They have more um, exposure to language outside of the community. And so low income kids, we know are gonna be the heaviest producers of dialect, but they also produce really advanced syntax and semantics. So their language is good. It's just not standard. It is a variety. And unfortunately, we expect advanced syntax and semantics should make you a good reader. But we see the advantage of using this advanced language disappear almost immediately after kids enter school. We don't completely know why, but I suspect that low prestige issue influences it that we don't value what we're doing. And one of the things we do is we try to change it or discourage its use. And I, that is really problematic for kids because we see that even when we're looking at fourth grade, fourth graders, what we've learned about dialect is when African-American kids are reading um, general American text, they are reading it with dialect. And so if you listen to them read aloud, we use the gray oral reading test if you listen to African-American fourth graders read aloud, they are deleting the copula, they're changing the verbs, they're reading it in their own system often, because remember it is English. And so it's a little more subtle than reading across languages. But students know that those words are on the page. So what we see is that students improve their use of standard or general American English by slowing down. So if you're giving an assessment where rate is a concern, they look really slow because they're spending a lot of time trying to make sure they're getting it right or that it's accurate. But then as the text gets harder, we get to the penultimate paragraph, the one, one before they're just gonna crap out on the test, it's over. Be that particular paragraph has a lot of dialect in it. Again, it's a trade-off. If you are trying to comprehend text and you're trying to read it, um, words that are more complex, because in this penultimate paragraph, the syntax will be more complex, the vocabulary will be more com complex. Well, kids don't have the resources for that. There's a trade-off. So they trade it off with dialect. So we see that the harder the text gets, the more dialect we see in oral reading. When the text is easy, easy words, easy syntax, kids can hold on to the text exactly as it's written, but the harder it gets, they have to make choices. My choice is to try to understand this word. My choice is to try to understand the sentence, the sentence um, context. And in order to do that, I cannot be worried about whether the copula is present. I cannot be worried about whether I produce that ED because there's some harder stuff for me to figure out. Again, that's cognitive load. So in order to manage text, sometimes I have to use dialect, but there's a cost for that. That's what we found in this article. The cost is that um, when, remember the mismatch hypothesis? I asked my colleague, Mark Seidenberg, who, study, who does computational modeling, can we figure out whether the mismatch hypothesis is true? We always thought it was, but we weren't sure. And so what he did was he built a computational model where just briefly, where the um, input, which was the spelling and the oral language either matched or they didn't. And so the spelling and the pronunciation either matched or they didn't. In the cases where they matched, it took the model approximately 350 trials to get to mastery of the words. When they didn't match, it took more than a thousand trials to get to 75% mastery. That's the cost we're talking about. 
the cognitive load for the child. Doesn't mean they can't do it, it means it takes longer. So what does that mean for us as teachers? It means we have to give them more time. We have to give more time, we have to give more exposure, we have to provide more opportunities. Remember, this is about access and opportunity. You have to have more opportunity. So when I hear teachers say, I hear teachers say a lot, when I, we talk about reading, they're really proud of their reading block. We have a 90 minute reading block. And my response to that is always the same. That's fantastic. But when do you read? Because the reading block is about instruction. When does the child get the opportunity to read, to practice, to have the exposure that they need to reduce the cost of dialect when they're reading. Um, that's really, really important. So this was what I just said, and so I'll skip this. So it's whether or not it matches matters, but it's not just the mismatch. As I said earlier, it's the magnitude of the difference that matters. So for those kids that we call high density dialect users, the ones for whom more than 50% of what they're saying is impacted by dialect, those are the kids who are having trouble with reading. And so we look at dialect on a continuum. This is how we quantified it. So it's the degree to which you use dialect in your oral language will influence um, how quickly you learn to read and how well you learn to read or write. Because we just did it in writing already as well. And we talk about this as linguistic dis distance. So how far away is the child's language from classroom English. The further away it is, the more instruction and time and opportunity you're going to need to learn to read well. Remember Antono said, we should be talking about these kids like dual language learners. These are the kids he's talking about. It's those high density speakers. It's not everybody. It's the kids whose language is really far away from the standard. Dialect density impacts spelling, it impacts reading, it impacts writing. And the relationship is reciprocal. The ability to read well helps you learn how to use the language of print. Okay, but if your density is high, you will have trouble getting to the print. And so for these kids, they need the opportunity to extend what they know about language to include what's happening in the classroom because this is what we see. This is um, syntactic processing, so sentence comprehension. The kids who use the most dialect are down at, if you look at the horizontal axis, axis, 100 is the kids where everything they say is dialect. There aren't very many kids like that. But the more dialect you use, the more likely you are to fall below this reference line. The less well you are comprehending syntax, and this is across grades one through five. If we look at it for reading for each grade, we see the same pattern. So the more dialect you use, the more likely your scores are to be falling in the lower range. Those kids who aren't using a lot, the kids who are uh, producing dialect at 40 or above are more likely to be doing well. And so we know that this really matters. Does this mean kids shouldn't use dialect? I don't think so. Every child should be able to use the language of their community. But what it means is that we need to account for it in teaching and learning better than we are right now. Right now, we're just assuming because it's English, it's either good English or bad English. No, it's a language variety. Kids have learned something before they get to school. They are not blank slates. They learn how to use language the way their community uses it before they get to school. Yay, good for them. But now in order to read, we need to make sure that they also learn to use it the way we're using it in the classroom. So we're not talking about replacing what kids are doing. We're talking about extending what they know to include what we need them to know and do. That's called translanguaging. It's not code switching. And so it's the idea that kids come to school knowing a lot. We allow them to use what they know and then we add to what they know to include what we want them to know in the classroom. And so that's our job because the ability to move back and forth between systems um, really strongly predicts reading achievement. Low dialect users don't show this problem of reading or language risk. It's just the kids who use a lot. I said I learned this in Georgia. Why? Because, oh my God, there's not a final consonant in sight. 
everybody speaks Southern English and African American English. So a lot of those kids were in this high dialect group. And so I got to see what that meant for them. So somebody listening is saying, but that's not true in California. Sure it is because it's a continuum depending on where you are. Your reference group is the group in your area, in your region. So when I was in Michigan, even though high dialect users in Michigan don't use as much as the kids in Georgia, they were still the kids who were struggling. So your region is your reference point, not necessarily Atlanta, but the idea still holds regardless of the region you live in. So learning the language of school is critical. And we see that most kids by the end of second grade if you haven't learned to use the language of the classroom, you probably won't spontaneously. We see um, kids who are gonna learn it, learn it between kindergarten and second grade. Then we see a bunch of kids plateau. And we're trying to understand who they are and what influences how easily you learn the language of school or the language of print. Some of them are impaired, we know that, but a lot of them aren't. It's about a third of kids. And we know a third of them don't have special education concerns. So what should we do? We need to allow more time to learn. I said that over and over again. The middle one though, we need to learn more about the language that your students speak when it's within languages. Which things are they doing count as dialect and which things are developmental and which things are wrong. That's the thing about being a kid. All three of those possibilities are possible. It's a language variety, it's a developmental error, or it's just ungrammatical. And so learning more about how your students are using language allows you to figure out where you need to insert yourself um, to help students kind of move along. So if you know, for example, that students are producing F for TH, then you need to spend more time on TH because the way you produce a sound is also the way that you perceive it. So we need to spend more time making sure that everybody has this. So we have to build in more time, not only for phonemic and phonological awareness, but more time to practice reading. I don't see enough reading in schools, especially low income schools. We're so focused on shoveling in information that the natural ways that most kids learn to read with instruction and then with practice we do the instruction piece, but we aren't always giving them the practice piece. And if you have students who don't have books at home, they need to be reading at school. Or you can send books home and then not get upset if they don't come back. So we need to value and respect the home language and how it differs and can support print because it can support print. We just have not worked very hard to figure out how that happens. And it will allow us to seek some solutions that are more positive, that look for the strengths of kids who are using language differently, differently and not just the deficits. Right now we're using this subtractive process. This is what you're supposed to do and this is what he's not doing. That's not, that has not worked for us. And so instead of looking at language that way, we need to think about how the differences that we see can support print and support learning to read and how we can facilitate that as instructors, whether it's oral language, reading, and also in writing. So I'm gonna stop because I have been talking nonstop for a while and um, there's just so much. There's just so much and we could listen to you for another full hour, but thank you so much for that incredibly informative session today. We are almost out of time, so we don't have a lot of time for questions, um, but I wanted to mention two quick things. Dr. Washington, if you'll just share the screen again, I want to share the- Oh, I uh, forgot, sorry. No, no problem. The companion document that we've created to accompany each webinar. Um, we did get a, a, a few really good questions in the chat too, um, which we could uh, also answer via email afterwards. And um, if it's appropriate to ask Dr. Washington for responses to those, we can follow up via email. Um, this webinar uh, recording and companion document is available to support the people who have uh, participated in this webinar today and has some really wonderful prompts and questions and, and areas to explore pertaining to this content. So take a look at that. And then if you could just go to the next slide,
we have our survey for today's webinar. And if you can fill this out, it would be of great help to us at Glean and SCOE and uh, give us some information on, on how you enjoyed this webinar today. Um, we are at four o'clock, so we don't have any time for questions, but I truly appreciated this opportunity to hear from you, Dr. Washington, such amazing information. So thank you for sharing your time and your expertise. Thank you.